folks coming in. We are recording this session, um, so the recording just started. And um, I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker today that I'm thrilled is able to join us. This is Emily Clasper. She is the Director of Strategic Services at the University of Rochester for the River Campus Libraries. Um, she has been around for a long time. She was a, a library journal mover and shaker in 2012, and she's uh, worked extensively with all kinds of libraries, public, academic, and special, helping them better serve their communities. So uh, I had a look at her um, eclasper.com uh, website before we reached out to her, and some of the topics that she's spoken about in the past really resonated with me, including when change is a four-letter word, placing your library at the center of your community and keeping it there and let it go, things that we need to stop doing in libraries. And as you can see from the title of her keynote, we've been talking around, you know, what does normal mean? What does return to normal mean? And should it be the same normal that it was before? So Emily, please take it away. Awesome, thank you so much, Lucy. And uh, thank you everybody. Uh, for having me. Let me just get up here so I can kind of introduce myself as well. Um, like Lucy said, my name is Emily Clasper. I am the Director of Service Strategies for the River Campus Libraries in not so sunny today, Rochester, New York. Um, if you have any questions that we aren't able to get to today, I'm always happy to chat. Probably the easiest way to uh, get a hold of me is on Twitter at eclasper. Um, yeah, so right now I'm uh, my day job, so to speak, is at the University of Rochester, where um, uh, for all of the libraries on our river campus, I'm the director of service strategy, so I oversee all of the public facing um, staff, um, uh, all access services kind of things, uh, including interlibrary loan and of course reserves and our circulation desk and, and all of those things and coordinate with the um, libraries at our other campuses as well. Before that, I've been there about a little over three years. Before that, I worked as um, uh, at the Suffolk Cooperative Library System, which is a public library cooperative um, on Long Island. Um, I worked there with uh, helping 56 libraries do the things they do well, even better. So um, yeah, so I've been around, around the block with some crises before and with some major changes. And uh, what I have found though, as I'm sure most of you have, is that no matter how many uh, crises and moments of change we all have been through professionally, uh, this, this last year plus has been a little bit of a, little bit of a challenge and something quite different from the kinds of uh, circumstances that we may have dealt with in the future, or sorry, in the past. Ah, I need more coffee. <laughs> so um, I think that right now we're all starting to get around this place where, all right, we've, we've been through this really, really ridiculously tough uh, year plus of this pandemic situation where everything just closed down. I mean, I don't need to recap for you how difficult and all the different things that we've been through in the past year. Um, and right now what I'm seeing, not just where I am, but as I talk to people um, in libraries and in other uh, professions and fields across the country, um, there's just such a strong desire right now to get back to normal. Everybody's just always talking about how, oh my God, I can't wait until things get back to normal again. Um, you know, that, that kind of thing. And we're getting close to that point where we can really start doing this and realizing some of that. Um, I know I was, I was looking at all the vaccine numbers this morning from across the country. And in New York, um, today they expect us in New York State to reach 70% um, of the 18 and over population has been fully vaccinated. They expect that to be today or tomorrow, that that, that number actually gets reached. And so we're, we're a little bit ahead of um, some of the other uh, uh, states across the country, but you know, it's such a hopeful thing to me to see things like that and say, yeah, okay, this really means that we can start getting, getting things back on track. Um, I think the issue though here is that it is so, so tempting for everybody to say, let's just go back to what we were doing before. And I have some questions about that. I mean, I understand it. I totally get that 
we've been through this crisis and these like 15, 16 months, I don't even know what it is anymore. Does time have any meaning? Um, where if everything has just been an upheaval and we want that comfort, we wanna go back. We wanna snuggle in under the blankets like this cute little kitty cat and, and just feel like cozy and warm and safe because everything around us is familiar again. And I wanna do that too, to some, some extent. But there are some ways in which I feel like, you know, just like when you have a bad day and it's raining out and you're, you know, you're not really looking forward to facing the morning, you just want to dive back under your covers. That is extremely tempting, but doesn't necessarily uh, solve any of the problems that are that are happening. So I think that as tough as it is to come out from that snugly warm blanket um, mentality, I think that we really have to put a lot of thought in this moment as libraries, um, just as individuals, but all across the board, we have to think about um, what it is that we're so tempted to go back to. And parts of the things that we want to go back to are really, really positive. They're the core things that we do as libraries for our communities. But there are other things in there that might necessarily not have worked to begin with. And so I think we have to be really intentional and really mindful about what it is we're, we're going back to when we go back to normal. Because normal uh, may not have been working so well when it was uh, in place to begin with. I was reading a book recently that was talking about how in life, many times endings of things we are, are um, almost synonymous with beginnings. So, you know, you get to the end of a situation and something new starts. You get to the end of the land and that's where the ocean begins. So endings and beginnings kind of work like, yeah, work together very, very, very closely. And it's when you come to an ending of a major situation like this pandemic situation that you have to not just think about, okay, this is over, we're gonna start again but this is over, how are we gonna start again? What is this the beginning of? Not just what are we putting behind us? Which leads me to introduce you to our word of the day. So you're gonna get really, really sick of hearing me say this word, but okay, too bad. It's called tough love. So the word of the day is opportunity. I've really, over the last uh, few weeks and months, started to look at, um, you know, the, this situation that we're in right now where we're ending one thing and we're looking forward to going on to our new reality in terms of opportunity. Where can I find opportunities in all of this um, that's happening right now? Because it's, we're in a really exciting position. This is where I've kind of come to with this. This is a baselining moment. This is the point at which we, meaning you and me and all of us together, get to decide what normal is going to look like point forward. I, that doesn't really come, come around on a grand scale very often. That only really comes around when there have been major historical moments that have huge cultural change, which we'll talk about a little bit more in, in uh, the future and in some of the rest of the, our uh, presentation today. But that is a huge opportunity. That's one of those once in a lifetime, maybe not even opportunities where you and I and all of us together get the chance to say, what is it we want to do? We, ha we have the normal that we inherited, but we can rewrite that now and say, that's not necessarily exactly what we're gonna do from this point forward. We're gonna decide what we want normal to be and how we want that to grow and evolve into the future. And I'm just so excited. The more I think about that idea, the more I uh, lose some of that dread of not knowing what the future is gonna be like and feeling uh, very responsible for, oh, if I mess this up, you know, is it, is it gonna um, screw everything up in the future? No, 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 no. We've got these, uh, this huge opportunity and it would just break my heart if we didn't take advantage of that. Um, definitely, this has all kind of uh, come to my mind out of this idea that um, whenever there is difficulty, 
um, their opportunity comes out of that. So, um, you know, whenever you have these, these historical moments, there is a plan or, or there is an opportunity to uh, make new plans and uh, leverage the situations that come out of difficulty and find new opportunities to uh, use our problem solving and to recenter ourselves to make what we're doing in terms of what is normal, what are normal operations, so much better and um, re-baseline everything to fit the more current situation. So um, I would not have chosen to go through all of the difficulties of the last 15, 16 months, but since we did, the way I look at it is we might as well grab onto those opportunities that came out of it. So a lot of the opportunities here are um, to me, a chance to look at what we're doing and, and look at what came out of um, all of these difficult times and just reflect a little bit and recenter ourselves around our values. So um, values are so, so core to a profession like librarianship. So we have our core values of librarianship. Um, I'm not gonna say them all right now, but if you look those up from ALA, I mean, there's, there is a set of core values that we all kind of have this agreement professionally around that are the most important things in our profession. So things like diversity and lifelong learning, uh, uh, service, professionalism, uh, sustainability, social responsibility, service to our community. Those are all things that are core values to everybody who works in libraries. And this gives us a chance to say, all right, as we move forward, the things that we do, are they really centered around those core values? Or have we, you know, along the way, either gotten off of the path or um, has the path itself changed and we need to find the new path? Um, also values within your organization. Each organization has its own values that are um, so, so important to what they do. So at the University of Rochester, our values um, may not be exactly the same as the values at your organization because of the community we serve and the, the situation that we're in and we're a research university and, and things like that, um, which goes along with community values as well. So the values of the community we serve feeds into our organizational values. And these are all things that I think we have a moment here that we can come back to and say, are we living up to these values in all of our services, all the things that we do? And also have any of these changed in the last um, uh, 15 months? I'll just call it 15 months. I know it measures differently for everybody, but for the sake of today, I'll just call it 15 months. So in this last 15 months, have any of our community values changed or become reprioritized? Because if that happens, we need to look at what we're doing in our libraries to make sure that we are um, really a bit values-based organization. So does this mean that we now suddenly out of nowhere when we have absolutely nothing else to do? Do we need to like have a new strategic plan? Do we have to rewrite our mission? Do we have to like, you know, undercut everything of our libraries and just, you know, burn it down and start over? I'm going to say not necessarily, because honestly, like, who's got the time? Libraries are notorious and not in a bad way. I think this is actually um, one of our strengths. We're, we're pretty uh, notorious for, what do they say, building the plane while, it, while it's flying. You know, we have to be giving our services and so on while, we, um, while we're reinventing ourselves all the time. So I don't think that we're talking about a situation here where we grind everything to a halt and reinvent everything about your library. But there are some little tools we can use, like what we're seeing here, you know, the, the uh, golden circle that Simon uh, Sinek uh, popularized, made, well, um, created and popularized, I should say. It's his idea. Um, you know, there are, there are some tools that we can use to do just some, some smaller exercises around where have our values changed, where are our services, um, where do they necessarily need to make some changes and so on. So if you're not familiar with uh, this concept here, the golden circle, this is actually a great um, concept, I think. I always come back to this um, with the libraries that I work with. 
um, where you're really centering whatever it is that you do in your organization around a central why. Why are we doing this? You need to have a deeper purpose of, around what you're doing or else you're just going through motions and it doesn't resonate with anybody. It doesn't actually necessarily uh, serve the, the needs and the values of all of the folks that you need to be serving. So um, this is actually, I just did an exercise with my own staff around kind of rethinking what's our, what's our why these days? Because prior to the pandemic, the values and the needs of our students and our faculty and our researchers at the University of Rochester, you know, were pretty, you know, pretty stable. And then all of this upheaval. So we really needed a moment to go back and say, why are we doing what we do? So with this, and I do have the, I have um, at the bottom of the slide here, when you take a look at that later, or you can just uh, kind of Google it, it's, it's a very popular thing. Um, I have the, the link to the YouTube video where he just kind of in short explains this and does a much better job than I do. But basically, um, you know, looking at why do we exist? Why are we doing things? Um, all, all of that kind of thing. And then working out from there to say, all right, now that we know why we're doing things, how do we do it? And what is it we're doing to get it done? Rather than sometimes we do the opposite thing. I've done a lot of work with libraries around workflows and so on, and very commonly folks are starting with, okay, what is it we need to do without really defining the why first? So I think this is a really good transferable concept for this moment to talk about, um, rather than trying to rewrite our strategic plans and our mission and our vision and everything, to, to really come back to this and say, all right, why before the pandemic may not be exactly the same as our why after. All right. So I keep talking about so much has changed. So what has changed? If you could go back to New Year's Day 2020, right? Yay, brunch. Um, but if you could go back to that time, like immediately before everything really just started to fall apart for all of us, what would you tell your New Year's Day 2020 self about what has changed in the next year and a half that, that would come? And when I first thought about this, I was like, wow, so much. I would have to sit myself down and be like, oh, my friends, here are, are the lists of things that, that are going to change for you over the next year and a half. And it's ridiculously long, both on a personal level but also, you know, a professional and with my kids and like all of these things. For libraries, so I actually went through this kind of thought exercise and I, I wrote down all of the things that I would tell myself. And then I brought it back to, to libraries and I started to realize as I wrote down all the things that had changed for me in the library that I work, libraries that I work for and with the libraries that I have a connection with, a professional connection with, um, the kinds of things that had changed there. And I started to realize that in many, many of these changes that we've seen, there are individual opportunities. And sometimes it takes a little looking for, you gotta look a little close to see the treasure that's there. Um, and the, the real uh, gem that comes out of um, all the changes that have happened in our libraries. So I, again, like I went through this exercise and I identified a bunch of them. And I'm gonna share a couple of them with you right now that I have seen. So for us and for many other universities, um, we've seen, oh, and also with public libraries too, my friends in public libraries are, are, are giving me the same kind of input just in a little different language. Um, we've seen a real shift in the relative importance between physical and digital resources. Um, I know at the university level, that has been huge, especially when you talk about um, course reserves. Um, so, um, you know, with, with course reserves, we used to say, you know, we're going to put all of your physical, all the books that you need for your class are going to be back here on the shelf and with a limited circulation so everybody can have a chance to use it, right? We have done a complete turnaround on this where it used to be, here's all your physical books, 
And if you need backup for that, we'll get you some digital copies and we'll make sure that there's digital resources to back that up. We're ready for the fall. We are completely ready to say, we're gonna get you all the digital stuff and the books are the backup because we're still dealing with the situation where we have a lot of remote learners and we have folks who can't get into the library still to access those physical resources. And I'm seeing this in all sorts of different libraries in different ways, where they're talking about, you know, the focus that was so, so physical. That's not at all to say that physical things are going away. I don't believe that one second, but there has been a shift in that relative importance. And maybe it was a shift between, you know, um, physical uh, materials were so, so, so primarily important and digital materials were, were not used very much at all. And now they're used a bit more. That's not to say that, you know, they're more important in every situation, but there is a new balance to be found. And that is an opportunity to look at our collections management, our access strategies, all of those things to help out our patrons around um, this physical, digital kind of reallocation of, of um, uh, attention. Um, because in a lot of cases, that's not going away. That's a new normal for us. I definitely have seen big changes in our relationships with our physical spaces. Um, in, in many ways, especially in public libraries, we see a new appreciation that people have for that essential community space that public libraries provide. Um, that's one of those, I think it's one of those, you don't know what you have until you lose it. And then everybody says, oh my gosh, we really, this really is essential to, to our community. And I see that a lot with public libraries, um, it, you know, that we've got this essential community space. But we're also at the same time, simultaneously, we are seeing this realization that not everything we do in libraries is tied to our physical spaces. And that's something we've known, I think, like on a, a cognitive level for a long time. There's been a lot of efforts over, you know, the last 10, 15 years for, for you know, get outside of our four walls and, you know, get out into the community or use alternate spaces and so on. But boy, did it hit home now because not only did we, um, you know, is it, let's do it in a different space. We're also seeing, let's do it in not a space. Let's do it in cyberspace. So there's a, a real rethinking, I think, of what um, our relationship is with our physical spaces. There's also, this is fascinating to me, new uses of spaces. So I know we had to kind of revise a construction project that we're, we had planned to do last summer, got postponed, and now it's being done right now as we speak. I'm so excited. Um, but this is, was to revise some, uh, to uh, renovate some study spaces on campus. And um, over the, the past few months, we revised some of that because there are new uses for that space that weren't there in the original blueprints, especially when it comes to people who are taking online classes. Um, they, they need a place to sit down and be able to use their computer to do meetings or classes and, or you know Zoom zone as, as the picture here is. So there's lots of new uses for spaces, which may be different in every single library. So I think that's something to really keep an eye out for. All right, tons of changes in working environments. We can never forget um, the fact that we are not only a public space and a public service, but we are an employer and a workspace as well. And um, as a manager of many different employees, like this is really top of my mind too. I actually picked this picture because it's really, really super ridiculous. And I'm like, uh, yeah, I don't even know how she gets power there. Is she working on a typewriter? What's happening here? But I think that, um, you know, the, the point it really is that we're really rethinking, and this is not just libraries, this is across all sorts of industries and, and workplaces um, everywhere, worldwide. How we work, where we work, when we work, um, what kind of models do we need to do this and to make flexibility, not just realistic and um, workable for our, 
uh, for our organizations, but also how, to, how do we make it equitable? That's a big question that we have in our library right now is that there has been demonstrated that it doesn't really make sense now to just go back to, okay, now everybody's in person from eight to five um, again, and everybody's sitting in a chair all the time. There's a lot of reasons why that doesn't make sense anymore. Not, not least of which is a talent and recruitment, uh, you know, talent recruitment and retention thing for our, our uh, employees, but also supporting employees um, and actually in some cases getting certain kinds of work done better. So there's a lot that goes into this, but we need to make sure that when we do this, we're doing it in an equitable way for everyone as well. So there's a lot to think about here, but it is absolutely 100% worth thinking about and not just saying, all right, I'm climbing back under the cozy blanket and everybody's coming in all the time um, because we need to really do some thoughtful uh, work around that. All right, changes in the needs of our community. The, the fact of the matter is we do not live in a 2019 world anymore. It does not exist anymore. And the changes in our community um, ha have happened and a lot of them are gonna stay. And that varies very much from community to community. Um, I've, I've spoken to just so many people, so many colleagues from across the country where they're talking about there have been these shifts in what the people in their community need. And it is very, very worth it, I think, at this point for each of us to be engaging really intentionally with the members of our community to determine what that is for us. Um, it's, it's really all across the board. Um, I can't even like give you a, a bunch of examples because there's just too many of them. But I think the bottom line there is to talk to your community and do it in a very, very intentional way. Don't be passive about this and think they're just going to come to you or it's going to be obvious. I think that we need to be hitting the streets a little bit here to find out what has changed for people because libraries work at the service of their communities. And if the needs of that community have changed, we got to be there. We absolutely have to be there. Talk about um, you know retaining our relevance. That's it right there. So lots of, lots of changes have, have gone on. I could, I could go on just on that for a very long time, but I had some other things I wanted to talk about too. So you know, just kind of looking at these broad ch changes, I do think that it's really worth thinking about um, not just the hardship part of it, but absolutely the opportunity. So um, you know, I, I actually came across this picture on um, Unsplash, which, which does, um, like a Creative Commons licensed uh, stock photos. And I was like, what is this? And I said, actually, that's a really good question. I know it's like a stock photo and, and not really necessarily supposed to be taken all that seriously. But I was like, what can you do that you couldn't do a year ago? Because that's the other side of it. It's not just about focusing on what got taken away or what got changed or what are the hard things that we had to deal with um, what actually can we do today that we couldn't do, do a year ago? And I came up with a pretty good list for myself of that too. So that's where we start to, I, I just was so impressed with this picture because I said, you know what, this is something that we should be also asking um, in order to really focus in on some of the, the opportunities that we have, which leads us to things have been changing. If we just go back to the before times and reverse everything, and we're just going to start change, um, doing things that way again, what are the opportunities that we have missed? Because there are things that have changed in my library, in your library, across all of the libraries across the country that we may want to consider keeping. What are some of the things that we have done to deal with the short term? difficulties of pandemic life that kind of serve as a turning point for us and might be really worth keeping, whether it's in its present form or it's, you know, we modify it to, to uh, take better advantage of it in the future, what are we going to keep? So I've got a couple of things that I'd like to suggest, maybe not just go out and say, oh, we're just going to keep that because Emily said so, that would be ridiculous. But to think more intentionally about where are the opportunities 
presented in keeping or considering adapting some of these practices in libraries into the future. So I'm gonna bang through these pretty quick. Quote, number one, library, fi library fines. Listen, uh, full disclosure, I hate library fines. I'm totally against them. We can debate that in the future. <laughs> um, you know, we could take that, that debate offline, but a lot of libraries over the course of the pandemic either relaxed, reduced, or just eliminated library fines because people couldn't get to the library. It was at, in some areas and in some cases, it was an unrealistic expectation that people would return things exactly on time and um, that it would be handled uh, by the staff in a in a way that made uh, library fines at all fair, even if they you know were fair to begin with. So we have some opportunities here um, to look at this and say, you know what, we relaxed them. Do we have opportunities here to look at how this impacted equity of access? Look at how we might adjust our budget to, to handle reduced or um, uh, eliminated fines in the future. So um, it's an opportunity there that if you pause them or if you, um, you know, reduce them temporarily, Maybe this is a time to say, how temporary does that really need to be? Remote programming is a huge opportunity, um, has some huge opportunities for um, our, our long-term operations. Um, there may be, depending on what, what's happening in your community, some real long-term benefits to, um, to maintaining long uh, remote programming that uh, you may have started just as a bridge during the pandemic um, in order to open up access to other populations. But also, if we think about that workplace flexibility, does that provide more, more opportunities for, for flexibility for our workforce that will help us make um, flexibility in the workplace more equitable for everyone? So that's something definitely worth thinking about. It's something we're actually talking about a lot in the church that I go to, because what they found when they went to online services um, was that there was a certain population that will only come to church on Sunday if it's, um, if it's in person, but there's also another population that will, uh, that really benefit from those remote services, homebound folks, people with childcare or other caregiving responsibilities, people with job responsibilities, people with mobility issues. We found that there was this whole population who could participate and access that resource um, much better if there was a remote option. And then of course, there's a lot of, you know, people in between who will come either way or, you know, things like that. But the, at this point, the long-term benefit of reaching that many more people and offering that opportunity to so many more people means that our church is, is looking actively right now for ways to make sure that we can do both in the future. And it's not an easy thing. It's extremely complicated, but it, they've decided, they said, you know what, this fits with our values and this, this um, is, is worth the work. So it might be worth saying, you know, we're not just going to shut down our remote programming. Let's see if there's a way that we can do part of it or we can um, uh, modify what we're doing so that um, we can give a benefit to the community in the long term in this way. Very closely related, remote services. So um, this could be like remote reference, um, uh, different, different kinds of uh, services that you might provide through chat or through email or through other you know, remote means. Um, take a look at it. Who are you serving through that? And does it match up with folks that in any cases you might've had a harder time serving in other um, situations? And where is the community need around that? None of our remote services that we've developed over the pandemic at the university are going away because remote learning is a thing that's gonna be with us um, for a very long time, and hopefully we'll be improving over time, we're going to keep them. Are we going to adapt them a little bit? Yeah, because we want to keep things um, evolving and keep things sustainable, but they're not going away. So that's another area that you might look for some opportunities. 
um, you may look for some opportunities here where um, you can be using your digital resources more effectively. I know for us, the digital resources went from being um, like moderately important, depending on the discipline, to absolutely 100% central because of how people could access information during the pandemic. And again, it's not going away. The relative importance of our digital resources has shifted. And so we're looking for new ways that we can incorporate the use of those resources into our services. Maybe different models of, of providing our services that help people to use the digital resources, the kinds of things that our good friends here at uh, Galileo are helping you uh, uh, get access to. And uh, that may be some uh, good collaboration opportunities as well. So think about that. Where are those opportunities from that? Self-service options. For us, this was huge. We installed self-checks. We did a self-pickup uh, hold shelf. We um, did a, anything that could be a self-service kind of situation that avoided hand-to-hand -hand or face-to-face -face contact between a staff member and a patron was something that we put into place and we did it overnight. I don't ever wanna do that again, but it, it happened. Another thing that we put in was space monitoring software. Um, you see on this little thing here, here's one of our libraries and our students can check the study spaces on their phone ahead of time to see where is it really super crowded. So all of these kind of self-service things, they went over so well. And they really were very different from the kind of service model that we'd been providing before. But guess what? They went over really well. And they, um, the, the students, the faculty, they, they have attached themselves to these things and they like it. And it gives us opportunities as well. I love it with all of my staff. Anytime that I can take one of my staff members who are intelligent, brilliant people, and pull them off of these like uh, operational kind of tasks and put them into a position where that really requires a thinking human brain and problem solving skills and so on. So I've been able to reallocate some of my staff's time away from checking books in and out and away from um, directing people to where study spaces are less um, uh, crowded and, and things like that into these real problem solving activities where their talents are put to better use. So that's something that um, was a real opportunity for us that I am gonna keep hammering away at because I, I love it when my um, smart people uh, get a chance to use those talents. All right, and then the last uh, one I wanna say here, oops, sorry, I hit it too many times, um, is talk about things like curbside services, right? I'll tell you right now, I need this. I am, you're gonna pry my curbside services out of my cold dead hands because if I can't drive up to Target and they just bring, you know, the, the thing that the one thing that I needed out to put it in my car, I'm just, I, I'm done. Like I'm sold, that's it. I have a busy life. I have two kids, I'm working all the time. I, I need these services and I am not alone in your community. I mean, honestly, my food just needs to come to my car. And it's not different for the other kind of errands and life functions that I have um, in the world. I want my library books to come in my car. When I um, worked for the public libraries on Long Island, people used to always make fun of me because at the time I had two little kids and I was always like, libraries need a drive through so that busy moms like me can like pull up and just get their stuff. And they'd always laugh at me. They'd be like, just come in the library, you know? And I was always like, no. I'm very stressed out and I need this service. And, and now I know I got it wrong because I didn't need a drive-through, that's too hard. I needed a curbside service. So I think it's, those are the kind of things that we can look at and say, is this something that gives a benefit, even if it's a convenience benefit, not necessarily um, all of the other benefits it could be giving to people with mobility issues or they, um, you know, have other difficulties with getting into the library, even if it's just the convenience of it, that's still an important service for people. So those kind of things are things we should, before we just say, we're not doing that anymore, 
let's look at it really carefully and say, who is this serving and is this worth keeping? Along with that, I would say, I've seen a number of libraries are doing like wireless printing and then they just bring it out to your car so you can just you know, pick, out, pick up your printout. Why not? Why not? Is that something you can work into uh, your staffing model to keep it going? Worth a thought. So really like look for those opportunities and all of the things that you did. If we don't do this anymore, or if we you know, kind of go back to normal, what are the opportunities that we're throwing away with that? Because we can use those opportunities to grow. All right, before leaving you today, I'm gonna to get out my crystal ball a little bit. And I'm gonna make a couple of predictions for libraries in the next year, two years, short-term stuff. And none of this is any ground shattering thing. This is all gonna be stuff that you're gonna be like, yeah, this is in fact things that um, we're gonna to have to deal with. And um, we know it, we know, we already knew. So I'm not looking to be like some like genius, like looking into the future or anything like that. But I do just wanna make sure that we understand some of the things that we're gonna see, um, I think, in the next few years and really have to deal with it in a very intentional and focused kind of way. So the first one is that we are absolutely in a place even right now where we're gonna to have to be thinking about how we deal with trauma. That is, um, you know, everybody has had a really hard time in the past 15 months, both individually and collectively. But like saying it's a hard time is an understatement. It's not just that we, you know, oh, this was kind of tough and everything. This was a devastating experience for so many people. And you'd be surprised how many people and who you encountered, you know, during the day for whom this was an absolutely devastating past 15 months. And you might never even know that. And it's not just from the pandemic. There was a kind of a per perfect storm of things that were going on. Um, not just the pandemic and, um, you know, how that may have personally impacted people, but there's the whole economic insecurity landscape, um, the economic uh, impacts of shutting things down and so on. Um, all of the social justice movements and Black Lives Matter and all of that stuff happening at the same time has had an incredible emotional toll on so many people in our, in our communities. The political environment this just uncertain future, um, climate change things, science and technology changes, all of this stuff happened at the same time. And I think the result that we're seeing is that at different levels, every individual at this point is experiencing some level of trauma from this. Um, this does not, this kind of massive um, stuff does not happen and uh, leave people unaffected. So that's gonna impact your staff, especially staff who are returning to work at this point, but also the folks who have been there. This is a picture of me. I've been back at, at, in the building in some capacity since the end of last June. Um, that is very unusual for the rest of our, our folks, but there are so many things that are going on and we need to look at ways that we need to support our staff in all of their, their places to make sure that this traumatic, these traumatic impacts are something that we're being really sensitive to. Same thing with our patrons. We don't know what's happened to them, but they have had a traumatic um, experience in the last bit. And we need to be very mindful of that. And um, we're gonna be dealing with that for a while. I've included a couple of slides here that I'm just going to skip by for the interest of time, but you may want to look into um, some of the literature that's out there about um, trauma informed approaches to dealing with individuals comes out of the medical field with trauma informed care and the educational field with trauma informed practices, where we make sure that when we are dealing with people who have experienced trauma that we are not um, that we are creating safe places for them, that we are supporting them properly, and that we are not re-inflicting harm on them. So I've got a couple of resources here, um, and the CDC has a number of resources around uh, trauma-informed practices that you may want to look at because we need to be very, very um, cognizant of this with all the people that we're dealing with right now and for the 
foreseeable future, honestly. Another thing we're gonna have to deal with, turnover, right? So if you have not experienced this yet in your library, you will. Major moments um, like this cause people to reassess. They may have economic reasons. They may have um, shifts in their career path. They may have um, all sorts of many, many, many different reasons why they may wanna leave a job and move on. They may wanna retire. Uh, they may shift responsibilities within the organization. So there's going to be some staffing changes. There's going to be restructuring. We're, we're starting to see this in, in our organization where um, people are shuffling around. People are retiring. who have been thinking about it for a while. People are doing all sorts of things. So when this happens, uh, it's very much like the don't just go back to what you were doing. Um, my advice around this is to be extremely intentional about how you handle these situations and look for the opportunities to use the staffing changes as a way to align with your new why and look for the opportunities that that may present for, um, for your organization as people move, move on or, or move around. In that, though, is always this element of change management because um, for the folks who are still there, still in their regular job, there's a lot of support that they may need through all of this in terms of communication, feedback loops as, as decisions are made about what is going to happen with the staffing of an organization. What can we all do to support each other through that and make sure that nobody is feeling um, kind of left behind and um, helpless through that uh, situation. All right, another thing, um, I won't say too, too much about this, but because we already really talked about it uh, a little more, but community expectations are definitely going to be changing as a result, I think, of kind of a cultural trauma. So we have our individual trauma that we are all carrying around with us right now, um, but there's larger community and cultural trauma that goes on that, that can also um, really impact what is needed within uh, the, the community that you serve. And those changes are still happening. We're not done. Um, one of my staff members the other day was saying, you know, everybody tries to tell us that the pandemic is over, but the pace of change has stayed really, really fast. And I'm getting really tired. And that was a moment where I had to say, okay, we need to find some way to support our staff in this because this is, has become a marathon and not a sprint in terms of the pace of change because it's not over yet. So um, in terms of what the community is asking for and what they need, not always the same thing, um, we really need to be uh, thinking a lot about how we can position ourselves to do this in a way that supports them, but is also really do doable for the library. And a lot of this assumes, or I'm sorry, a lot of this um, means that we need to confront some assumptions. We need to look at what our right answers are in libraries and decide, is that still right? Are the answers that we had for things still gonna work out for this little girl right here and getting her what she wants and what she needs? Are we asking the right changes? And how can we adapt ourselves to these um, systemic changes that are happening around us as a result of community and cultural trauma? And then last, I don't need to tell anyone who works in a library that funding is always uh, um, being threatened. I mean, always. Throughout my entire career, there's never been a time where I'm like, wow, we have plenty of money and I'm not worried about it. It just, it's part of our profession, unfortunately. But I think that, and we may not all be seeing this quite yet, but it is coming. Um, I think a lot of uh, uh, libraries had some kind of pre-existing um, financial insecurity or even deficits that they were dealing with. And then when this all hit, it was like, okay, let's just survive, let's just survive. But the, um, the, the other shoe is going to drop at some point. Um, I've been reading a lot of studies of nonprofit funding that's going on. And at best, the forecasts I'm seeing are that there's a lot of uncertainty. 
And for nonprofits, uncertainty is not a good news. It's not good news, not at all. So there's going to be, um, I think, coming up a lot of things that we need to keep a very close eye on in terms of how funds are being allocated for libraries. Um, because as much as everybody was like, oh, we love having you back open and, and so on, the honeymoon's gonna be over quick. And there are a lot of financial challenges in other sectors that are gonna be, um, we're gonna be in competition for funding with. So um, that is, that's really important. Um, yeah, so that's all gonna, um, kind of hit us, I think, very, very soon. And we need to put a lot of concentration into how we prepare for that and how we very actively deal with that. Not just passively, like, you know, our, it, our traditional advocacy is great and we should absolutely focus on that, but we might wanna get a little more active with it and go out and do some real political action around this so that we make sure that we are not the ones that are, um, you know, uh, just cut in, in all of this reallocation of funds. All right, so coming back to our word of the day, um, I, I would just ask you to just take this with you as you go through the rest of this excellent, excellent lineup of programs that Galileo has um, lined up for you. Um, and just keep this word in the back of your mind, opportunity. As you hear people speak and you see what they're doing, I would just keep coming back to that and say, okay, where's the opportunity for us in this? Where is, you know, this is a really great idea. Does it have an opportunity for us to grow our services or to make a case for something else? Um, just keep that in mind and think about the ways that you can imagine um, make, leveraging those opportunities uh, for your organization because we've been through some really tough times, but it really isn't over yet. I hate to be a downer. This is the downer part, right? Um, the fog is kind of lifting, but I think the, the hesitation that we're feeling to move on is really coming from this, this just huge desire to go climb back under the covers again and go back to our normal. And that is just such a big danger to us all, I think. We've gotta be thinking about what the, the new normal is gonna look like and how are we gonna decide? Because that's really cool that we get to make that decision. How are we gonna decide what that looks like and how are we gonna achieve that? So I wanna thank you all. This is my dog, Kirby. He ha always has to make a, a little cameo appearance in, in my presentations. Um, please, please uh, feel free to get in touch with me at any time if you've got some questions or ideas. I love to chat with people and, and uh, kind of find out what everybody else is thinking. Great, thank you. That was excellent. Um, so we do have a couple of questions. Um, I'm gonna actually combine these into one because they're, they're very similar. Um, the question, one question was around handling eBooks with publisher restrictions on textbooks. Um, how does this, how are you handling that? And does this figure into your adjustments for, for reserves, for example? And then related question more generally, what are your thoughts, observations on how relationships with vendors, content mm -hmm. and otherwise change during this time? And where do you see the future of those relationships evolving post COVID? Those are really big, huge questions. But I will say, the way the way I'll address that is to say, so yeah, the the um, the ebooks and publishers and the restrictions on the textbooks that is one big, giant, sticky issue that we're all dealing with right now. And how we've decided to work on that through the University of Rochester is by refocusing our strategic efforts at the library around. Um, open access, uh, uh, open educational resources, OERs. And by rallying our faculty around, um, you know, to not only taking advantage of these, but publishing these and helping them to make sure that that is something that is on their radar as well as they design their courses. Our librarians uh, have, have um, first of all, we put together a statement that has been endorsed across our, all of our campuses um, by all of the faculty and, and um, the, the administrators and so on, saying that we are committed to this. 
and to making this happen and making this an active part of the learning experience at the University of Rochester. We also have been doing these programs where um, the zero cost hero program, where we're helping um, faculty make sure that they are uh, using resources that don't get us into such a, you know, a, a sticky situation here. And then we just recently got approval for a grant um, which is gonna be used to help um, more faculty get, do this and also publish um, OERs around this. So this actually turned into, it went from, oh my gosh, what do we do? We can't get you the textbooks you need electronically, which is still an issue, I must say, but it went to, okay, so what can we do this on a long-term strategy um, so that we are, actually helping all of the library community and all of um, you know, education in, in uh, pursuing different avenues for, for providing access to knowledge and resources. Um, there are some other things that we've been exploring in terms of controlled digital lending and, and so on to, to help with the more short-term aspects, but I'm very, very proud of what our organization has done around the long-term solutions and saying, let's make this a movement. Let's make this something that our faculty and our administrators are very, very much um, involved in. And then we are turning that around as we talk to our vendors. We got some shrewd, uh, shrewd negotiators on our staff who are talking to vendors and having these very, very blunt conversations with them about what our needs are, what our community needs are, and how much we're actually willing to pay them. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot going on behind the scenes that I'm really, really proud of at the University of Rochester, and I know that those are partnerships that um, are going to emerge from that with other organizations. So if you're interested in hearing more about it, let me know. I'll send you all the info. Oh, wait, Lucy, I can't hear you. Yes, I'm muted. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much for that, Emily. I think we are going to need to um, stop it there so that we can move on to our next session. Um, you do have your Twitter handle there at eclasper on Twitter. So I encourage folks to, to tweet at you if they've got uh, other questions. And thank you so much for doing this. Very, very interesting. Great. Thank you so much. And we'll see hopefully most of you over in the Galileo update and uh, portal demo session, which will be starting momentarily. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs>